Len Philbrick. Uh, just up front, this, this uh, project was a collaboration with another farmer, Steve Ide, and an extension agent, Irene Graves. And uh, this took place in 20, uh, 2014, 2015, 2016. All right, so uh, what is quinoa? And so it is technically in the spinach family. And so if, uh, when it grows up, the, the leaves, the harvest, if you pluck off a leaf, it tastes just like spinach. So that's uh, channel podium quinoa. Uh, it's considered a pseudo, a pseudo cereal, kind of, the grain, native to South America, and it's gluten-free. And it looks exactly like the weed for lamb's quarters. Uh, so it, it doesn't distinguish itself until it's about a foot high. Then you can tell there's something different going on here. So the objectives of my research for our Shisao research project was uh, verify viable varieties that can grow in North Dakota, uh, develop a producer-friendly way to plant and harvest. Uh, typically in South America where it's grown, it's all hand work. And so we're looking at the mechanical options. We're looking at test harvesting methods, uh, develop a direct marketing model and educate the public. Those were our objectives. And we were pretty good with that. This is my stand in 2014. That is all quinoa. That is not weeds. Every bit of that is quinoa. So that was the good, the good news. Uh, the height on that was, I think my lowest end was 36 inches. And on the high end, I think I hit 56. And that, that I took... Um, it was a very end of July, early August, and I think in about August 3rd, I had three and a half inches of rain, and that, that did weigh it over, so a lot of it did tilt over after that. So if it gets too much rain, it will go down. What you see here, you see a little bit like light shining, that is the grain right there. And I go out and pluck off a leaf, it's exactly what it's finished. So you could. I did sell food leaves at farmer's market as salad. No, no one had ever seen it. You never see that in any health food store, but it is what it is. Um, why I chose that? So going back, a friend invited me over, they served quinoa, and I said, I like this. And I like growing new things, and so it has a high nutritional value. This was a new crop in the area, no one was growing it. Uh, I like my adventures. It's definitely a biodiverse crop because there's nothing like it, so it adds something new to life, the, the landscape and the taste, which we'll get into an issue with the taste later. So this is technically the first time I ever grew it. So after leaving a friend's house and I thought, okay, I'm going to try this, I went online, found, found Wild World Garden Seed at Oregon, and they sold quinoa. So this is in the garden at the time I, I shared with my mom, and I'll, there's challenges with sharing garden space with relatives because Everyone has their agenda. So I planted 30 feet of this and I rescued part of it from being killed under her because she was in the process of taking it out. <laughs> uh, and I said, no, 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 this is my row. And she said, no, it's weeds. I said, no, it's not. And so uh, it, it was the quinoa, but it looked exactly like the lamb's course. So I mean, if you don't know that, you're gonna till it under. Uh, this variety here is chili, cherry vanilla. It was the only variety I ordered. And this was taken, this is end of September. And that year was pretty, we had a fair amount of rain that year. So uh, this is a harvest color you get with that variety. Not all varieties will have that, that color or look. Uh, and then th this in the garden, I cut by hand. Um, I had to get it cut before it was going to snow and I ultimately uh, shelled it out by hand as well. There were some challenges, but I got, I got seed from it anyway. This is another take of the same garden. Uh, what it, it does tend to start leaning down towards later in the fall. <coughs> this was not from rainfall, but but it was it did have it did have heavy plants. I planted very thick, but I also kept it watered. So I, that's probably why it did produce well. There wasn't, despite the competition, it had winter. So the experiment. So here's what we did found absolutely will not work. No till does not work with this. It, just, it needs a, a prep seed bed. Uh, so if it's poorly prepped, it doesn't work. If you overseed, it'll get too competitive and then essentially it, it just doesn't get very high uh, and you can't plant it too deep. 
that's an issue there too. So this is the this is where I tried a year before I got the grant, a little bit in the field. This is where I tried it no-till with my favorite tractor, a John Deere 40. Any two-cylinder fans out there? <laughs> The planter is homemade. My father made this years earlier uh, when we used to raise silage corn. And if you had wet areas, there's no way you're going to get in there. So after it dried out, he'd sneak in there with this tractor and that two-row planter and plant it in there. And the neighbors were wondering, how did the corn grow? We, we know you didn't seed that, but there's a secret behind that. So that's a, a John Deere 71 corn planter that we mounted on, on a piece of iron. And what had to be changed for this experiment is the corn bottoms were to swap out for beet bottoms. Beet bottoms have a death band, so you can't go more than three quarters of an inch below the soil. That's how you, you maintain your depth control. Um, I know some have tried it with a grain drill, but it ends up being a little too deep. If you put it the grass seeder, well then it's on top, and it has to get rain. At least this way you can get it in the soil. And so um, that the, the Model 71 John Deere planter is a very universal piece of equipment. I don't know if there's not a lot out there, but they're, they have a lot of uses. Uh, downfall that I had to deal with is I had to make my own seat plates. Once I drop it and some gear, the plates are spinning. You could order blank seat plates, but you had to drill your own holes. So that was a, a trial and error because I used the smallest bit and then start dropping seeds and realize, okay, going through, but you can't get too big. If you got too big, then you had plugged holes because two seeds would go into one. That's a picture of the depth band there that, that's attached to it. Um, and so if there are vegetable seeders out there, but I mean, this was the cheapest route to go. I think I paid maybe, I don't know, 30 bucks for the depth bands or something like that, that I used. Uh, that seed bed for this year, we went over it five times with the Roll uh, Rollflex cultivator. There was manure on it the year before, and Jesse can attest to this. We go heavy with our manure, don't we? Very. Yeah. Um, so that's why it was gone over that many times. Um, Wheat free is best, and on that field that year, we were pretty good with because we cultivate, wait, let things emerge. We, we got the weeds kind of under control. Uh, it does well in the manure. For those of us who have cattle, uh, lambs quarter and, and uh, livestock areas go hand in hand. So it, it does like that. The, uh, ideally, what we've found with research is that 12 to 24 inches ro rows are best. If you go up to Oregon, not get that back. Washington, WSU, and their plots with Kevin Mur Murphy, they had 12 to 24 inch rows. My planter is on a 30 inch row, which is typical for corn. Um, and ideally between plants, six to eight inches. So that, that was another trial and error with my seed plates is that I should have spaced <coughs> the holes a little bit more. I ended up doing that again. Um, I almost got it right, but that's trial and error. Germination within seven days. Again, it looks like a weed. Um, cannot have chemicals. And so competition, there, there's yeah, more than one year of data on that. This is what it looks like when it emerges. So here I had a little too thick. This year though it did some of it choked each other out. So some won and some just kind of went away. Uh, and everything you see there is except, that is not quinoa, but everything else in this picture is. So the germination was quick. This is what chemical damage looks like because within seven days of, of germination, I got drifted on. And, and so it took out a section of that field. Um, and so it, it cups very quickly. And this was within 24 hours of drifts of this photograph. This is the field that I planted in. And when I'm up close here, I can tell it's emerging in here. Um, that's what it looked like at the beginning. A lot, there's a lot of organic matter in this field. I, no, the field next door I tested. I think I'm in the 8% area on my, my uh, soil test with organic matter. Growth, so here, looks like lance quarters, but then I have other things in there. I, I got a two row, uh, row cultivator mounted on the same tractor so I could keep the rows clean. Uh, I had the shields to protect the dirt from going over. I know that sometimes you've got a vendor, Orby is one, one brand, I think it's a little better, but the shields I took off were from a 1940s model 
uh, corn cultivator that, that dad had not used since he was a kid. So we, we made it work. Uh, so there, there is you know, some weak competition there. This ground was not certified organic at the time. Uh, it would be considered transitioning. That, that was a challenge in that you know, if I could do it over, I would have had winter rye the year before and then planted it. And I would have had, this, granted the wheat competition this year wasn't bad. Height, there we go. So my highest was 59 inches. That's 58. The low end was three feet, but I think on average I was in the, in the 50 inch range. And again, this is taken about an hour before sunset and I got a purple tint with the variety here. Um, the varieties were grown from Wild Garden Seed out of, out of Oregon. Cherry Vanilla and Brightest Brilliant Rainbow, the two varieties. And there's several more out there. If you do it, visit WSU and post, uh, Spoke uh, not Pullman, they, they test like 50 varieties a year. I'm not sure how many come out of South America. But, uh, I wanted to distinguish this because part of the experiment was also testing amaranth, not Palmer amaranth, but um, Burgundy amaranth. Um, that's next door. And so I had the only Burgundy field around. Um, that can withstand a lot of rain, and it'll stand up in it. Um, by the time we harvested this, the quinoa was drooping. The amaranth will stand up straight until frost, and then the burgundy color uh, disappears in 24 hours, <coughs> which is a bummer. It's like, here's my pretty field that's now depressing in every appearance. But that's another view of it. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, when, it, it, once it got so high, it did provide the canopy to keep things from growing. And there was a point where once the top of the plants hit the bottom of the tractor, then I knew I'm going to cultivate. This is this little area here. That is where the chemical drift happened in there. Uh, so that was the area that wiped out because it, it 2,4-D moved in and kind of, well, it doesn't exactly do a blanket cover, but moves and settles an interesting area. Actually, where in front of me there was some too. Uh, a few random amaranth plants ended up in there too. That wasn't a big deal. This is one of my field tours. That was a different plot. Um, I should took it up. I don't, I don't like photographs of myself, but anyway. But. So what can you do when it grows? You could do nothing. Because the, the other grower, he did that to see what happened if we, he had narrow rows, to see what happens if you didn't cultivate it. You can cultivate it or do a companion crop. Um, a lupin was applied in the other grower's plot. He had more weed issues. Um, and so I think if, if maybe, I mean, I hypothesized if we didn't have the initial weed pressure, the companion crop would have worked out well. But for that year, it didn't pan out very well. Harvest. So generally, you should have a killing frost so it can dry down. And it did not dry down. It, it, had the, the maturing color, it just wouldn't dry down until the killing frost. Drying weather, so after the frost, it took a while for it to dry. Uh, we swathed it anyway. We could have straight cut it, but we felt swathing it would guarantee that it's going to dry down after the killing frost. And you want a moisture set, a moisture level like flax under 11%. So what I do is I go out there, grab some grain off my hand, stick it in the moisture tester, and test it. Then once we felt, you know, at one point I realized the grain is dry enough, the plant matter is not, because once you get, we combined in October, we waited that long because it just didn't seem to dry down and the frost came late that year. And, and it's like the window for opportunity at that time for it to be dry enough was until like three in the afternoon. And then once 6.30 came, we could tell that the combine was starting a little bit. It's like, okay, it's getting wet. That's, we have an L2 gleaner, um, so there's a certain all crop. So with threshing, because it's such a small seed, um, with the stalks and whatnot, the, it was easy to plug. Though it wasn't hard to unplug, but the line, air be wool setting 350 on this model, and, um, and so 50 points meant the difference between blowing all your grain off the back end or plugging up. So you had to be really precise with that. That was a challenge we had. Uh, and the trash. 
that was a shocker when we looked in the hopper and I'm, I'm looking like, um, where's the grain? Because I knew it didn't, I'm the guy who checks the sieves and I knew the grain wasn't blown off the back end and I just see like plant matter. And I dug in it and I could find grain. Uh, we had someone clean it and you got to separate it. So with the trash, we ground it with, with our oats for cattle. They hit it off, so it didn't, didn't go to waste by any means. There's still other things in there, so because we swapped it, you also had some pigeon grass in there. That made some things challenging. So there was some other seed in there because we got everything when we swapped it. And, and like on the plant itself, the seed starts pretty low on the plant. So where you cut it with a swather, you do get the pigeon grass or, or wild buckwheat. And so I had for a, a 2B bottle clipper mill, the 118 by 1 8 top screen and a 1 16th round bottom. Commodity traders out of uh, Chicago will make whatever you want and for whatever size clipper mill you have to. And so these are uh, courtesy of Steve Ide. Um, this was his test when he started testing some things. Let's see here, I'm going to, that was the weed pressure he had. Um, his soil fertility wasn't as high as mine. Um, and he used a regular hoe drill where he plugged holes to get the width. So he didn't have 30 inch rows, had much narrower, but the, but the weed issues were, were challenging, but he ultimately did combine. Uh, his, he had a little more, that, that site, I don't even, going into alfalfa to deal with some of the weed issues. And so you end up with a little bit more uh, weed challenges in that. So our lessons learned, seed bed prep is very important. On my site, we did cultivate more than the other site. We felt that made a difference. Uh, having the correct planter or seeder, uh, your date, so you gotta wait till after a frost. And I think you, I got in a little bit earlier and, and we weren't sure within each year, it's like, did we hit it at the right time or not? Because there's that line between, are the weeds gonna get ahead of us or are they gonna catch up to us? And the cleaning. Um, it is disappointing to look in your hopper, your combine and see all the other, the plant debris in it. But then ultimately I, I couldn't get every weed seed out of the clipper mill. That, that was a good challenge. And I think if we maybe if we swathed higher, maybe we could have avoided picking up the pigeon grass. In here. And the challenge with the pigeon grass is that it's about the same size as the quinoa. That really makes so you can see the color wise. You know that it's different. Uh, in the future, his plan was he wanted a different sieve for his combine. He he felt that would be the ideal planting date and a loop in between. Uh, we did put hairy vetch in a couple rows. <coughs> and oddly enough, it didn't germinate super quick, but it germinated enough that, that six years later, I still have hairy vetch here and there, but it's not real bad. Um, saponin. So, what you buy in store tastes good. However, there's a natural coating on the seed that, that is a pesticide, and the EPA does regulate this as a pesticide. So a scarifier is needed to remove that. Essentially, it's dust. But if you grab the grain, put it in your <coughs> mouth, it is horrible. I mean, it's, it's like vinegar is sweeter. Seriously, vinegar is much sweeter than, than anything put with sap in it. So if you have a scarifier that's a photo of one, you can get it cleaned off. I located a machine last year, so that that was a, a challenge with marketing this, is that consumers want, want it so they can the tree to cook. So I tried rinsing it, which works, but drying it was really very labor intensive. And um, so without the scarifier, you can't get it off, so I couldn't grind it for flour. So there's, you know, for pasta, this works well, but I did grind a batch uh, and tried to make cookies with it, but the sapling was there, I, I had to throw it out. It was just too, too gross tasting to try it. Um, storage, it should be pest-free, dry, under 11% when you put it in the bin. The market, so in the U.S., we import majority of it. Our demand here for quinoa has removed it from the, the diet of those living in Peru, where it's been a staple food for centuries. Yay us. <laughs> uh, 
that's the removal of saponin would impact, impact the cost, big time. Um, the cleaning is really, I thought growing it, I thought, okay, we got a plan for growing it, but then cleaning it was an issue because no gray elevator has a scarifier. Not that I found yet. Um, local market, I could get $11 a pound though. For what I did get cleaned, that's what I got for it. Farmers market. And we did whole cooking classes. We held two different ones of how to cook gluten free. Yeah. Making uh, pizza with it and salads with it. We had fun with it. This was some nutritional facts. Irene Graves, the discussion agent, provided that. Uh, I think some notable things are the protein. I'm trying to find the protein here. Where's that at? Is there a different one? Where did there? Oh, 16%. 16% protein. On that. It's a high in fiber. It's a high in fiber grain. Irene Graves provided this for us. She compared the size with lentils, brown rice, and brown uh, long grain, and short, short grain, and brown, uh, brown rice. So it was a very tiny seed. So when I was working with those seed plates, there was a lot of testing with the different size drill bits. And then gives you another idea. That is my own seed there compared to um, a dime. And this dark stuff right there, there, that's the little seeds we picked up from the field. That was the ones that were hard to get out. But what we did do, a few consumers were willing to buy it and deal, deal with sap, sap it in. If you put it in water, lukewarm water, for about an hour, I think even a half hour, the water's gonna get cloudy, you pour it off, add water again until it's clear. If you had a fine screen colander, then you could just keep rinsing and get it off. And the sap in was gone and you could eat it. That worked. But most consumers want it ready to cook and eat. So that's, that's a demand of, of our consumers here. So that's, if someone's gonna grow it, that's something they have to consider. What do the consumers want? Questions? Yes? Did you do anything with the plant material? The, uh, so in, in the, when we combine it, it, uh, it returned <coughs> to the field as fertilizer. However, the second year, we, we moved things around the rotation, and I planted it, and the weed pressure was, got to be too much. So the decision was made to terminate the crop. So we're gonna plow it under, we cut it with a swapper and bale it. And our bales, what did we get, five an acre? Yeah, something like that. You have stalks in that plant that are not as thick as a sunflower stalk, but still, it's a hard stalk. And it was baled dry enough. When we fed that to the cattle, they cleaned it all up, stalks and all, which I thought was really weird that they would clean it up that well. So um, it can work as your fertilizer, green fertilizer, or cattle will take care of it. And the grain was in there, the cattle ate it with the sap and on it. I figure if they eat the whole thing, it's, it says something. Yeah. Would the plant itself be high in protein? Or would it be like a kosher or something like that? The, I wasn't sure what, I don't know what the uh, protein level of the leaves are, but the grain is high in protein. That's a good question. Because I think spinach but is generally The cow high. didn't have any digestive issues? No, no issues, no sick cows. That was the first thing they cleaned up. It's like alfalfa, nope, we're cleaning this up. Yes? Is there any production acreage in the U.S.? So there's a, you say you're working with Kevin Murphy. He's we we did. I mean, I did three years. Uh, is there, is, yeah, is he creating lines for production acreage in the U.S., or is most of it produced outside the U.S.? The majority is still imported. There was some acreage in Colorado, and I know that there was some large acreage in Montana, but I never heard how it went, and that was like four years ago. Okay. Uh, up in Saskatchewan, there is some large production acres up there. And they're in the Esteban area, because Esteban has a processing facility in Fort mm -hmm. But we still import the majority of it. Do so they scarify them to get that? Yeah. They got a massive production scale. 